Thank you. And I know we are getting late, so lunch is waiting. But anyway, um, uh, I'll be discussing only Taj Mahal today. The other sites may be at some other time. Uh, as a part of our uh, institute uh, research activities, whenever there is a special problem encountered by Archaeological Survey of India, they approach us to work towards that problem. So Taj Mahal is one of uh, the one of the very most important uh, monument for us. So as the title suggests, that uh, uh, we are primarily carrying out geotechnical and structural engineering uh, study of Taj Mahal. So in in this study, uh, what was the main problem? There were two issues which were raised. One is the effect of water table of Yamuna. Because there, if you all know, I'll discuss this, that uh, Taj Mahal is on the south bank of the Yamuna River. And there were issues that the water table is fluctuating and what is happening to the foundation of the Taj Mahal, issue number one. Issue number two, they were trying to see what is the current state, obviously without touching the monument, and uh, is there any uh, problem with the structural stability or there are some sort of uh, damages or cracks which can uh, lead to danger uh, to this monument. So with these two objectives, we thought uh, what should be uh, done. So we carried out a uh, number of studies to conclude. Studies are still going on. 70-80% uh, we have completed. So the content of my today's presentation will be brief introduction about Taj Mahal. I'm sure all of you know a bit about it. Then material used for construction geotechnical investigations and GPR studies, 3D laser scanning, that brings me here, because that is a thing which we thought uh, we'll be using to solve or to, to help as an aid to the structural engineering issues for the actual conservation. We used it. Visual inspection and damage mapping, we also are doing some sort of air quality management and response due to human movement and structural analysis, and then in the end we'll conclude. So, as we all know, this is treated as the symbol of love. A king has made this monument for his queen. So. This was constructed in 1632 AD, and mostly, most part of it were concluded by 1648. This is a, uh, constructed around 310 by 510 meters, and it doesn't have only Taj Mahal, it has many other structures around it, many entry gate. So we have a mosque on one side, where on Friday the prayers are allowed. And on one side there is a guest house known as Mehman Khana, not, not being used for housing the guests. The, the whole concept is being planned on a, on, a, on a measuring unit called Gaz. It is not meters. So the Gaz is nearly 32 inches or 18, 81.28 centimeter. This was popular at that time. And multiple of this gas unit has been used in planning of the whole Taj Mahal. The architects who have studied it, it is one of the most symmetrical uh, monument uh, that uh, people think has been created. So um, let us try to see this uh, Taj Mahal, if I look in the plan, there are, there are five parts we can divide. 
One is this moonlight garden. It is across the bank of the Yamuna. Then this is the main, uh, sorry, this drawing is not to the scale, please. Uh, this is the uh, Taj Mahal complex, which has the riverfront trailers containing Muslim mosque and guest house. Then the Char Bagh garden. Then the Zilau Khana containing accommodation for the Tom attendants and two subsidiary Toms, this portion. And the last is the Taj Ganj, originally a bazaar or a market, you can say, uh, which was as a Ankar Karwan Sarai, only terraces of which are still left. It is not completely left. Some of that has been, um, has to made way for the development of the city. I'll just show you some of the views, how Taj Mahal can look at different time. People have, uh, in my opinion, it is one of the most studied monument, if not say in the world, and uh, many books, many literature are available. We have done, uh, we have tried to do, I put my one research scholar to collect all the data, and in the end we were all always confused that what is correct actually, because there is so much written and uh, everything cannot be verified as of today. So, but as far as beauty is considered, it is having different shades of the Taj when you see it at the different time of the day or even in the moonlight. So, primarily as a um, construction material, this is a brick masonry and the brick sizes are 18 to 19 centimeter by 11 or 2.3 centimeter, very, very thin bricks. The load is supported on this uh, thin bricks, is called Lahori bricks at that time. It, has, it is using sandstone of uh, two sides, uh, which has been used, and sandstone is uh, used at some places. Then white marble, which makes, which gives it all the beauty, it has taken from the quarries of Makrana in Rajasthan, approximately 400 kilometers uh, away from that site. So we can think how much effort must have been taken to bring them. And this white marble is only used as a cladding to the um, brick masonry structure. So, and for inlaying work. Other than this, uh, structures, they have, uh, artists have used semi-precious stones, which are written here, turquoise, Yamnia gate, and others, and rare stones, and these are all used in a, uh, for inlaying work and for decoration, for writing the verses of the Quran and uh, other things. So this makes it uh, very beautiful, and uh, if you sometime visit Taj, you can, uh, the, the guide can tell you by how the light, with the light, they, uh, they can change their shade and they can show you the colors. Common stones like gray and yellow sandstone, red stone, black slate, and uh, white marble is again, has been used. Now, uh, when we talk about the geotechnical investigation, a team uh, of uh, two geotechnical engineers uh, under me, they investigated we had some of the data from earlier investigations 20 years back or 30 years back. So I'm sorry for the poor quality of the sketch, but if this is the Taj Mahal, main Taj Mahal concept, we have borehole data record about the soil condition all around the Taj borehole ranging from 40 meter to 140 meters depth. So we know the soil strata below it and uh, all boreholes were utilized for soil sampling and SPT test. Mm, Sivrinjing term, we want to know the stability of the Taj. And the clay layer starts from nearly 25 meters below the Taj. So please remember that what we are trying to do is, we are trying to know uh, whether further any danger to the Taj uh, for the settlement. Uh, Mm, my colleagues have calculated, you know, the, there is a, a sandwich of the clay and the 
um, sand layers below the Taj. So they use their uh, 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 mathematical tools and uh, try to calculate the total settlement of the cohesive layers that clay will be around 1.652 meter and in non-cohesive layers because sand is already compressed so uh, there is no settlement uh, possible. Based on today's uh, calculation, what we feel, 99.6% of the settlement has already taken place because so much time has gone and uh, any future settlement uh, would be insignificant. Uh, that's what we is our geotechnical findings. The foundation of the monument is in the state of submergence. Uh, it is always in the submerged condition. Your Yamina is very near to it and uh, there is uh, no effect of the water pounding or the um, sometime drawdown or uh, water coming up because it is still in this state. One more interesting thing, I am showing you this picture. This you, If you visit Taj, you will not be able to see um, easily at least. This is the original uh, um, uh, grave of the Mumtaj Mahal, the, the queen. And we tried to, there was a um, saying that maybe there is something below it, we cannot dig it. So we tried to use different uh, frequency antennas to see uh, what is inside. They allowed us this descent of the staircase, which is normally closed for the public. And uh, we tried to see, and there are precious stones still uh, uh, there on that grave. So um, we tried to find out what is that, but we could find that the merely four meter below is the uh, foundation for this uh, structure, nothing great about it. Some metal containment is also there. We do not know what is in, we can't dig it out. And we, are, we don't want it to. Outside also, we tried to do the um, GPR survey, but uh, nothing very drastic or uh, the change in anomaly, we, we didn't find anything. Uh, laser, I think for laser scanning, I should call Pranay. The company, we outsourced the work. We said, you do it for us because uh, we are not the experts. So Pranay, will you please come and elaborate about uh, what you did and... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I don't like to use the dice. Uh, so I'll give a brief introduction about myself. I'm uh, Pranay from Plant Engineering and Geomatic Services. Uh, so we are the laser scanning experts and we introduced laser scanning to India back in the day. And so uh, when we were, we were in Lebanon with Dr. Mittal and aspects, we are always committed to the education institutes or something. So when the project came about Taj Mahal, it was of a holistic approach. As he had already explained that it was a lot more than laser scanning altogether. So apart from that laser scanning, there were structural studies, there were ground penetration, radar studies, and other stuff which we had to do. And the goal was to carry out a very precise structural analysis, so we had to do laser scanning over that. So at that time, so means we literally allocated all our resources to the Taj, including three, including three short range scanners and one long range scanner. Uh, so I'll quickly give you a brief that, okay, what we did. So apart from the scanning, we had to georeference it. So we used uh, GPS in this and uh, Sorry, that's a brief introduction of pegs again. Okay, so apart from uh, the reference it, we use GPS, and apart from that, so we used one station and two rovers to monitor, uh, to, uh, to georeference the location, and we had used the static processing uh, for the GPR cell. So for the GPR, we had established a very intricate grid, 5 meter by 5 meter size, and again, once again, cross reference that grid with total station. Just to make sure that when we do laser scanning, we have a number of stations to carry out the survey and we do it very precisely. Uh, so as I've told, uh, told these scanners which we have used, one was Leica SDS 6000, one was Leica C10, one was Leica P20. And apart from that, for long range activities, we had used Rodigal VZ4000. For short range activities, we did get a fair amount of data 
where we had to do some very intricate details as Taj discovered the very precious stones and Indians all together. So then apart from that, then the second thing was that Taj is a very gigantic structure and that's something we have to calculate all the ranges and all. So apart from that, so we used the long range scanners from all four minarets and we were able to collect all the data of the backside moonlight gardens and the front four gardens as well. And apart from the Taj, there were multiple structures, there are two additional tombs and then there is the guest house, there is the mosque and apart from that there is a royal gate as well, or the Shahi Darwaj as we call it. So those all were captured using, uh, so this is the royal gate and the scanner is VZ4000. Uh, so I'll give you an example of comprehensive data capture. So currently the point cloud which we are seeing is only from a short range activity. So we see that okay, major, major portion of the garden is still remains missing that okay, we don't have a lot of data for that. And apart from the time constraint, we had to finish it on time because Taj is a very famous structure. The footfall is like 70,000 people on an average day. So you can imagine that okay, we have to control some people, so sir, please give us side, we are doing scan here. So apart from that, so we had to capture data very quickly as soon as we got some brief time intervals. And on the weekends, the crowd is somewhere between one and a half lakhs to two lakhs. So this uh, again shows us that when we had used the long range regal scanners, so the data improved quite significantly. And apart from that, we were able to club the entire data very precisely together. If I talk on the uh, technical accuracy, the overall for this monument, we got a 4 mm accuracy. So again, quick coloring of the scan. For coloring of the scans, uh, though we, we have the options of internal cameras in like a CD and the CDN and but just to make sure that the data looks much better. So we use at, at certain points where the lighting conditions are good enough. So they use internal cameras. Apart from that, we had used the external electron ones. Uh, so interesting takeaways. As Dr. Mittal had mentioned, that uh, the grids which are allowed to see for the public are the fake ones and not the real ones. The real ones are in the basement, so for the first time someone actually got to see that and we were able to scan those places. Uh, the structure is a false dome. So, the, uh, so for example, if you are seeing the dome from the outside and from the inside, so basically it is a hollowed out structure, so it is a false dome and there is one full room inside that dome. Okay, so that and that gives you the structural stability and the other interesting takeaway is that if some of you, if you might be familiar with the sacred geometry, uh, so Taj Mahal follows the golden rectangle rule very precisely and the Fibonacci ratio as well. So this shows the dome and the false dome. Uh, so 3D mesh model. So apart from that, uh, so we use the, we have used the uh, Geomathic Studio for creating a 3D mesh of the Taj Mahal. So as Geomathic was not able to handle data, uh, a lot of data all at once, so we exported the data part by part. Say like some of 300 MB, some of 800 MBs, and then all were once again imported to Geomagic and then we were able to create a mesh for that. So apart from Geomagic for the structural analysis, we needed some CAD model as well, maybe in uh, say CATIA V5 or IGS or even STEP format. So apart from that, using the Geomagic, we had decimated the model to quite a good extent and then we brought out in CATIA and sometimes in image over as well. So we generated two models, one was the hollow model as if there is nothing between the walls and other was the solid model. Uh, so this is an example of the point cloud video, uh, true view of Taj Mahal. And you know, one other thing which you would be interested to know is that we have also managed to get our hands on the Microsoft HoloLens development kit and we are working to make true view for HoloLens as a virtual augmented reality. Uh, so I think Dr. Mithul once again take over from that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Uh, you know, when we were talking about the sort of damage mapping, these areas you sometimes miss when you visit Taj. So, but ASI has been monitoring this. I have seen uh, glass strips monitoring from uh, 1948 or over time, and uh, there were some. Uh, little cracks uh, or some monitoring, but glass chips were intact. So what it gave us idea that in last 50 years, uh, 25 years back the line, nothing has moved as such. Maybe some tremor of some time or some settlement which was going on, that might be the cause. So nothing much, but as soon as uh, outside is considered, some of the places we have even marble cladding getting uh, 
slightly damaged or you can say it needs some care. ASI has already been informed about it. We have already advised them to use some crack monitoring gauges to be installed at some places where uh, this is to be done. Then uh, one of my younger colleagues was interested in monitoring the uh, SPM and carbon dioxide and other than SO2 study, sulfur dioxide study has already been done by one of the researchers 15 years back. So uh, he studied and he is trying to conclude that uh, everything is under control because Supreme Court of India has already banned all the pollutant industry uh, within uh, 50 or 100 kilometers of the Taj to be shifted and they have already been shifted. So no pollution industry is uh, allowed around Taj. So uh, that gives us a good respite today. Uh, we were trying to monitor the footfalls and uh, the technique was trying to use not 100% successful by mo uh, vibration monitoring of the, of the movement of the people and we try to do that. Still the work is going, I am not saying it is concluded but the, still it is an open challenge how to monitor uh, uh, whether we can restrict number of people to visit Taj. Uh, coming to the uh, almost the last part of the presentation for which we thought because we know there is a false dome we had good structure or architectural drawings available with the of the Taj Mahal, but we wanted to be sure that uh, uh, our drawings that we do analysis because earlier when there was computing facility was less people have uh, analyzed that with simplified models so we wanted it to be analyzed with uh, actual uh, 3d model so we requested tax that you give us in the following formats the 3d output so that the same can be imported to the structural analysis software and uh, uh, we imported this 3D model, uh, CAD model was then imported to ANSYS uh, FEM package and uh, we had to remove some of the finials in the very fine parts because they were not required structurally and they were creating problem in the mesh uh, conversion. Uh, material properties, uh, uh, nearly 20 years back one of the researcher has taken um, got a portion to take some of these samples. So these are uh, material properties on the actual sample tested from the Taj uh, brick masonry. Uh, so like Young's modulus, poison ratio and density. So we did uh, nearly, because it's a big model, so we modeled the minarets as well with it and uh, 2.7 million elements and 4.1 million nodes because it is a really heavy program. And uh, we used uh, solid elements, uh, 10 noted, which can take care for all these things. The uh, model is, uh, right now, it has been analyzed for gravity loads, the dead load. Dynamic loading part is going on. Uh, already simplified dynamic loading work has already been done, as I have told you, but we are trying to do it with the actual, uh, this thing. Uh, what we have tried to obtain the deformation and the stresses due to gravity only. So uh, you can see if you take uh, this, this 13.6 mm comes, if you take full raft here the base is the lateral deformation resultant x and y. If I, if I take it lateral deformation radial in radial direction, so and please note that the deformation shape has been scaled. It's not that Taj is tilting, so it has been only scaled. So this is 30 mm outward, 2.9 mm inward, inward means towards the center, and 1.2 mm outward pale blue. So this is quite insignificant as far as uh, structural engineering uh, part is there. And uh, uh, what is more important that uh, the more, uh, this is the center, and I will come to the total deformation. If you see the dome part, the total deformation, it can uh, go on up to 25, 21 mm. Now we asked them to give us the hollow models also because we wanted to know 
that where are the stresses and what is their uh, uh, this thing. So for the gravity load, you can see that the maximum stressed portion uh, is no, it is not the maximum. The dome part, 0.7 to 1 MPa, is bright orange and yellow color. As you can see, and 0.4 MPa is here in this dome. This portion is only having 0.4 MPa uh, stress, and uh, here in the dome, which can take a lot of load, it's, uh, it is taken 2.2 MPa. But compressive strength of the masonry can be 5.59. So we are very much within the uh, safe limits. If we see the tensile stresses again, uh, we get the values uh, of the range of 0.1 to 0.4 MPa, while it can go up to 0.57. Tensile stresses going close means we have to go for the dynamic analysis and see whether more of the tensile stresses are developing in a uh, um, dynamic condition. Uh, Taj Mahal, uh, is in seismic zone 4 as far as Indian standards. Uh, but one of the things what we did in this is the interior of the minarets. We, they are in fact hollow, but we took it as a solid because we didn't have that sort of uh, space. yeah space there to do. So we took it solid and it is on the conservative side. Means we have taken more load. Actually it is not that much loaded. So um, I think it is a engineers always do this kind of assumptions which can lead to the safety. The maximum resultant deformation is 13.7 mm. Maximum vertical deformation 21 mm, I already told. This is already discussed. And the maximum tensile stress, overall tensile stress is 0.2 mp. So this is also quite safe. So uh, if I want to conclude uh, my, our study as of now, is that, that no visible dis or dislocation seen at the joint of the floors and the walls and the basement uh, below adjustment floor. At some location, plaster has been found peeling off from the walls of the basement where their scanner could not go. <laughs> so uh, we visited, we have a photographic documentation and uh, maybe if some technique comes up from the Stuttgart, we can, we can <laughs> convert it into point cloud uh, or we can go again and take some special photographs and uh, but the masonry inside is in excellent condition so uh, there is nothing to worry about it and uh, some places in the basement area there are some termites so ASI was already uh, taking care of it um, nothing to worry the cracks as I told you has been uh, uh, observed, but they are 45 years, we are monitoring them. We are asked them to monitor it digitally now, so it is better and a more accurate record and indicates good structural integrity of the monument and is expected to be monolithically in the event of ground shaking and detailed dynamic analysis is still going on. GPR profile also doesn't show any anomalous zone, subsurface floor of the basement. It looks all good. Thank you.